Hello and welcome to the Sacral Circle, where we are healing sexual trauma collectively and lovingly. I'm your host, Janie Tarazas, and I'll be interviewing individuals from all walks of life who have faced sexual trauma or abuse in one form or another and triumphed over their adversity. On every episode, a guest will deliver inspirational support, words of comfort, and empowering healing advice. They'll courageously share how their experiences impacted their lives and what they did to reclaim their mind, body, heart, and soul. Be sure to subscribe to my podcast, The Sacral Circle. Just search Sacred Stories on iTunes. I want to thank our listeners for joining us today on The Sacral Circle, the self-love haven where we leave judgment at the door. And today I am very grateful to have the beautiful Heather Larican Regino. She is a private chef, a business owner, a blogger, a cookbook author, a certified fitness and Pilates professional, a mother and a wife. Her business is called Your Sassy Chef. And she likes to go by the healthy mind and body enthusiast. I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Janie. Yes, we met at Dream Week and her and I were invited to speak at Pep Talks. And yes. she got up there and her story was like, what? <laughs> what? And oh. right away I was like, oh my gosh, she needs to be part of the sacral circle sisterhood slash brotherhood. <laughs> So, so Heather, oh my gosh. So, so anyway, tell us, tell us a little bit about how you started Sassy Chef, because I know that it's tied to your, your purpose in life and, and your pain, like you've turned your pain into your power and your passion and your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So when I actually um, moved here, I moved here from Reno, Nevada, and I actually grew up in Chicago and I went to culinary school in Chicago. And directly after I graduated culinary school, I moved to Reno, Nevada. Just no real plan. I just wanted to leave the cold, dark city. Yeah. Um, so I moved there and there I pursued, I was a vegetarian at the time. So I was cooking and I was working in vegetarian restaurants um, until I became a mother. And I was a single mom. Like I had a feeling that I was going to be a single mom because I chose to have a uh, baby, probably not at the most ideal time, not with the most ideal partner either. Um, so I had, you know, I knew that I was going to end up being a single mother. And um, when I became a single mom, I decided to stop cooking, go back to school to be a nurse. And I was bartending and I was in school and I was a single mom and I was like living two different lives because I was like super healthy single mom in school during the week and then like crazy party girl on the weekends bartending because that's what I did to, for money. Right. <laughs> so um, my son was five years old and we were in a position to where we had to move away from Reno, Nevada. His biological father just wasn't in the right place. He just wasn't healthy of mind and body. Mm -hmm. So we moved here to Texas, in San Antonio, stayed with my sister and my wonderful family. My sister opened up her home and said, you know, just come down here. You can finish up school because that's when I was starting to apply to nursing program. And, um, Zared, my son, he could just start kindergarten right away. That way you could just get settled in easily. You know, you don't have to have too much stress. So when I moved to San Antonio, I was still going back to Reno to fight for custody and kind of back and forth. So when we moved here, I ended up getting a job right away because since I was dealing with court, I had to get a job right away. My lawyer was just kind of coaching me through what to do as soon as I get there. And, um, I ended up getting a job at a gym, at Gold's Gym, just as a front desk girl and finishing off applying to nursing programs. Um, well, when I was applying to nursing programs, I met a private chef who needed an assistant. So I'm like, okay, I can, I can work for this chef. I used to cook. So I was working for this private chef and I was also a front desk girl at Gold's Gym. And I was cocktailing on the weekends and raising my son. And then I started applying to nursing programs. However, every program I applied to, I was denied. 
Mm -hmm. So I had to figure out a way. It was just kind of like, okay, I've been working the past five to seven years going back to school, trying to figure, you know, or like five years trying to figure, you know, get a job, be a nurse. And then when I applied to these programs, I got denied. So it was just kind of like, well, what, what next? Right. So I was working for this private chef. And as I, the more I worked for her, the more I realized I could possibly do this on my own. So I slowly just kind of started picking up clients randomly. Um, I ended up quitting Gold's Gym to get a job at Life Cafe, at Lifetime, the gym Lifetime Mm -hmm. in the cafe as a sous chef. So then Getting a job there, I started group fitness instructing and then slowly growing my business, working as a uh, sous chef in the cafe, working as a group fitness instructor, and then slowly growing my business at the same time, doing private chefing, catering clients. So it just kind of organically developed on its own. I was able to grow it and then slowly like quit the jobs that I had to grow this business. I love that you were so open to doing a variety of things so that you could continue to pursue your vision or this other mission of yours that you started to realize was was the thing that was feeding your soul. I know that as you were going through all of that, there were still some deep wounds that were lurking beneath. Oh, yeah. So tell us a little bit about, you know, your trauma drama. So the wonderful thing about being a mother is that you have a beautiful distraction, right? (laughs) Mm, That's true. Oh, it's so, and the funny thing is that before I was pregnant, um, there are a few years that were just really, really, really dark. And, um, it was, it was so weird because of all the, I mean, I basically medicated, I went through my trauma and my um, abuse um, during my teen years, maybe like 16 to like the heavy, heavy abuse years were between 16 to 18. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a little bit of abuse going on when I was around like 11, 10 years old as well. But I think everything triggered at 16 around those, that age when I was old enough to start like exploring substances and alcohol and drugs. So I medicated pretty much up until the day I was pregnant. Wow. Um, yeah. And it was, it's so funny though, because it's like, I, you know, like you gravitate towards like-minded individuals and all of us were like that. And at the time we didn't know, like we didn't know we were just friends and we were having a good time. So in other words, these group of individuals that were all friends had all dealt with some type of abuse or trauma. In your kind case, of trauma. In your case, it was sex trauma. Yes, yeah, sex trauma and physical and emotional and mental abuse trauma as well. So mm-hmm. I had, I had all, I had all of it. Oh my goodness! Was well, your perpetrator cl- connected to the family? Okay, so the sex trauma, it was a friend. Okay, and the physical and emotional abuse trauma was one that was connected to my family, and then I had another abuser who was actually my first relationship. So it was, um, I mean, and I think what the hardest part was, it was like that second round of trauma. Cause I had earlier trauma when I was younger, 10, 11. Mm-hmm. And then that second round of trauma, it was like back to back, like so much happened within a few years that I think it just like, like I froze, like I just, mm-hmm. like I couldn't, like I couldn't function. Like everything just kind of paused and stopped. And it's funny because I've read a lot about um, abuse survivors. And it's like, we get stuck like mentally and emotionally, we get stuck at the age we were when the trauma happened. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. for years, I just couldn't get my life together. Like I couldn't. Um, and I, you know, it's funny because I was always working. I always had a job. And even when I was like during my heavy drug abuse days, I was still working three jobs because I was like, well, I feel like a loser, but if I'm working, then I won't feel like so much Mm. of a loser. Wow. (laughs) And you know, you bring up a good point because productivity, being productive to the world says, I'm doing fine. Like I'm okay. You know? I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's because exactly what that says. And I, I feel like with that too, along with being a mother and having that, um, 
what do you call it? Having that distraction of motherhood. It's like productivity is also a distraction. Working three jobs, four jobs, whatever is also a, a distraction because you are so exhausted emotionally that you don't have time to think about what truly matters. And that is like, how am I doing inside? How am I healing? Am I taking care of myself mentally and emotionally? You know, you don't have time to think about that stuff because you just are so exhausted. You just go to bed and then you have to wake up the next day and go about your day. And in the in between times, I was abusing alcohol and drugs, cocaine, ecstasy, mushrooms, acid, anything, marijuana, anything and everything. <laughs> You're like, get me out of here. Yeah, it's like me. total I'm escapism. Sure. <laughs> but it's just so funny now because now they say that hallucinogenic drugs are supposed to help with PTSD. So I'm like, maybe I need to revisit it. <laughs> right. Especially now that you have like a, you're in a different place now. And now mm -hmm. you understand the healing yeah. aspects of it as opposed to mm -hmm. just the fun recreational part of going on a trip so that you can literally trip exactly. out. To so you can just have fun. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm purposely doing this for this reason. <laughs> right. So here you were doing all of this. You, you had your child. What mm -hmm. was the thing that sort of led to that, that I know you had multiple breakdowns and we will continue to, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like the breakdown, the breakthrough and all of that. But what was it really for you that got you to wake up to like, Hey, Heather, you need to start taking care of yourself. What was that? Um, so when we moved, I think that was, that was the break breaking point for me. And I felt like, so we spent, after my son was born, we spent five more years in Reno, Nevada. And I love Reno so much. And sometimes I wish I had have the healthy life I have now in Reno, Nevada, just because it's such a beautiful place. The desert, the mountains, the trees. Um, there's just such a great, it's such a great little quirky town with a bunch of culture. And it's so close to San Francisco and California and the places that I love. <laughs> Yes, I love um, Reno. I've been there a handful of times. Uh, have you? Lake, do you love it? I Lake Tahoe and Reno. I, oh my god! I know. There's like the energy so there is. Energy. You could just feel yes. the difference when you go mm -hmm. into a place that that has that much awe. It's all, I mean, it's almost very spiritual, you know, and like I, I mean, literally I would wake up and I had my choice of whatever I wanted to do. Did I want to go swimming? Did I want to go hiking? Did I want to go rock climbing? Did I want to, you know, I mean, there was just so much to do. And, um, but I, I drowned there. Like I, I, I couldn't, I wasn't a healthy person in Reno, Nevada. So even while I was bartending and like living that dual life, there were still parts of me that were like, okay, you need, something needs to happen because I was living two lives. I was like healthy during the week with my son and on the weekends I was bartending. I was doing a bunch of cocaine, like, and I would pack it in within like three, two to three days. And then on Sunday afternoon, I would get my son and it was just constant, constant. It was just this cycle of and my serotonin levels were all screwed up. So there was a time when I was really, I was just getting really, really depressed. And I was like manifesting, like something needs to change. I don't know what it's going to take, but something needs to change. My life needs to change. And I didn't feel like I was strong enough to do it myself. And even as a mother, I still didn't feel strong enough to make that decision. Like I was so, I just wasn't there yet. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the trauma, like I didn't have the confidence to be like, I'm changing my life. This is what I'm doing. It just, it wasn't there yet until we were prompted to leave until I had to make the decision, Hey, we need to move. And so you came to San Antonio because you had family here in SA. You said yep, I had a sister here, and it's so funny because my parents live in Vegas at the time. They were they still live in Vegas. I had another sister in the Bay Area, and since Reno is close to those places, I just assumed I was going to end up moving to one of those places. But the Bay Area, I was still in school, and I'm like a single mom student is not going to be able to afford rent in the Bay Area. Where would my son go to school? We would probably be living in the not the greatest neighborhood because that's what all I can afford. Um, Vegas, I just felt like it would be similar to Reno. So my sister lived here in San Antonio and my two older sisters whom I love dearly, but they've always kind of like told me how to live my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. For sure. <laughs> and, and still told this day. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, of course they're going to have their baby sister. So that's just what's going to happen. 
Um, but they like got on the phone, came up with this master plan. They're like, you're going to move to San Antonio. You and Jared are going to start your lives over. <laughs> they were like that light of inspiration that you needed and that little kick in the butt. Yeah. And it was just like, and, and because, and I think, and I mean, this could be, I don't know if it was because it's the little sister in me or I like the trauma, the abuse survivor trauma, but like I tend to not be confident with my own decisions. Mm -hmm. So like if somebody tells me, somebody whom I love and trust, tell me what to do, I'll just say, okay. <laughs> yes. And that's part of the, what we have to heal because we, yeah. Uh, because of that codependency. And so, and yeah. then also too, like you didn't, you hadn't built the self-esteem and the self-confidence to trust yeah. your voice. You hadn't even really connected to your inner voice. Yeah, you and so exactly. used to be I never really you. knew what it was, what my voice was, because I think when the trauma happened, it was just shock factor. And it's like, I didn't know who I was anymore. So mm -hmm. all those years of medicating, like I didn't have a voice. I wasn't exactly sure what it even was and like who I was and what I wanted. So I made the decision to move. It was, I think the end of July of 2009, we sold everything. I sold everything, um, in my apartment and gave it away, packed up what my son and I had in our car and drove from Reno to San Antonio. So I got here on a Thursday evening. He started kindergarten that Monday. It was like, boom, boom, boom like one thing right after the other. Mm. So I didn't even really have a lot of time. I didn't have any time to process the move and process what just happened. We actually both went into counseling. He went to counseling just so he could manage the, the change of his life. And even at five, he, like, he knew what was going on. He knew that he had to leave Reno and he knew that he had to be away from his biological father. Like he knew all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got him in counseling right away. And then, I mean, we just immediately started our lives. However, it still didn't trigger. Like I, it took a few more years for me to really, I feel really transform or really step into the woman that I was supposed to be. And I, you know, I'm still healing, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I was single for a long time until I met my husband and I had issues, relationship issues. And when I was realizing how many issues I had, I went back to counseling <laughs> before I got married just so I can work through all my stuff. <laughs> you got yourself a really good guy. And so you, you yeah. but it sounds like you really, when you did the work, you really were doing it for yourself. You were doing it for yeah. yourself first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Like even with your son, I'm sure you were doing it for your son, but it sounded like there was a piece of you that knew you had to do it for you come from there. So here you had another motivating factor. You had this awesome husband <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and it sounds like therapy was, was really the route for you. Were there other practices or mo healing modalities that you ventured into? Well, I, you know, I've always been an active person. So the fitness component really helps exercising, drinking a lot of water, taking your vitamins, eating healthy. You know, it's funny because even during my heavy drug days, I still always ate healthy and I still always exercise. And you know what? That honestly was like your saving grace. And I, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, because everything that you've been through and everything that you're passionate about really ties back into what are you putting into your vessel? What are you eating and drinking and mm -hmm. doing? But what are you also yeah. thinking and feeling? And you're tying it all together. And food mm -hmm. is such an integral part of our day-to-day -day life. Absolutely. And there's food that fuels us. And then there's the food that really depletes us. And so I love that that you naturally were, were doing the eating and the working out, which mm -hmm. was part of your saving grace. Yeah. I don't know how I survived. And it's funny because I still have pictures of those days and I'm like, oh my gosh, you look like you're about to fall apart. <laughs> it's like, so you funny, our perception. Like girl. <laughs> and you know, with like, you know, counseling therapy, I started going right after I had my son. So I, I've been through four different therapists. And I, and I feel like I needed to go to all four of those at different phases of my life because with each new year, there was new growth. And I'm like, okay, I'm no longer the same person. I'm having new issues, but I, I need to figure out how I'm going to get through this. So then every time I felt like I progressed, I would have to get back into counseling just so I can figure that and sort those things out. Beautiful. Um, and I love that you were so open and willing to get yeah. help because somebody like yourself, that was such a like, basically a doer and like you were just like go 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 and I think the do 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 was probably one of the things that like saved me was because I didn't stop and I 
I, I just didn't know how to stop, I think, mm -hmm. but it eventually got me in the right direction on the right path of doing, doing the right things. <laughs> right, right. You had that, you had that energy in you and that capability. It's just, you needed to use it in the right way for your greater good, which is what you're doing now. So, and you know, it's funny because when we're discussing breaking points, I actually just had a thought about something because I feel like with trauma there's layers and you know you slowly peel off a layer you slowly peel off another layer and i think another breaking point because when i moved here i was still like partying every chance i could get you know i mean i wasn't doing the hard stuff anymore but i was like any moment i any free time i had or any free night i had i was like at the bar with my friends and mm -hmm. just you know like getting and just having a good time partying and stuff and i was actually at a party and one of my girlfriends pulled me aside. She just got a divorce. She was, she be, recently became a single mom. She was telling me how hard it was. And then she was explaining to me how she felt grateful that she had her ex-husband there to help her. And there was co-parenting and there was child support. And then she proceeded to tell me, she said, you know, you don't have that. You don't have somebody that helps you. You don't have the child support. You don't have that person that you can rely on. And then when she told me that I was an inspiration and when she told me that it made me want to become better. It made me want to be like, okay, if this is how people view me, like maybe I should really focus on becoming a better individual. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Like I had no idea. And then she was just like, you, you're an inspiration. She's like, me, you know, like, and that triggered something. I'm like, well, maybe I should like, you know, maybe I shouldn't be partying so much if this is the case. Maybe I really need to explore more healing if this is the case. Funny enough, she said you inspired her, but she ended up inspiring and lighting up a fire inside of you. Mm -hmm. Like it just like illuminated it. And yeah. you saw, you really saw for the, maybe not for the first time, but it sounds like where it really like hit home. Yeah, it resonated with it has. And the superheroes are about taking accountability and responsibility. And what yes. are they going to do with the, the life and the time that they have here? And mm -hmm. when you step into, when you open up your mind to the idea of being here to be of service to others, you know, it's, it's a very powerful thing. We just have to remember that we're always supposed to remember how to be of service to ourselves. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so, I feel like that can be, we can forget that because we get so busy we just lose. We lose ourselves sometimes. Yeah. So what do you, uh, how do you maintain, you know, your sanity in such a, in such a crazy world? There's probably some mindful practices and things that you do on the daily just to make sure that you stay connected to your true yeah. self. Yeah. Um, I, I meditate, I pray, I express gratitude every morning. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing I do when I wake up is, um, just say, thank you. And I, and I always just say thank you for this journey and please allow me to be the best person I can be today, um, whether it's in work or play or being amongst my family or being in the grocery store. Like and mindfulness is huge. You know, be mindful of the people around you. I say that a lot. Um, I just want to deliver the best I can be. So I take a lot of time doing that. I, I read a lot, listen to podcasts a lot. Um, and my therapy and my meditation doesn't necessarily have to be quiet. Like I actually don't prefer stillness um, just because I, I feel like I kind of taper a little bit with AD, ADHD maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I, I, you know, even if it's like singing or listening to music, again, I do a lot of, I exercise a lot. So that helps. And just being grateful. I think, I think gratitude is huge. I think taking the time and I, I, you know, and also being, being aware of how am I reacting to this? You know, I think that's huge too. It's like, I, even if I catch myself not in the greatest mood or if I'm reacting poorly to something, like I, I always have to take a step back and I'm like, okay, hold on. What's really triggering here? Mm -hmm. um, There's this acronym, it's S-T-O-P and it's S, stop, T, take a breath, O, observe what you're feeling like internally or what you're thinking or what's going on around you. And then P, proceed with kindness. <laughs> I love that. 
I love that. <laughs> it's, it's so simple. <laughs> <And, all the> time. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were, yeah, and I love that you, you know, you're such a mindful being, you know, we need more people that are so self-aware and, and take it, take it as, as seriously as you do, you know? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it really does impact our, our well-being. You know, how we're mm -hmm. being impacts our well-being. Yeah, um, it's so true. I love also that you reminded people that meditation isn't always about just complete stillness and quietness. Yeah. Meditation mm -hmm. is just when you're in the now. You're just yes. in the now and, and you're, you're very lit like from you, you're, mm -hmm. you're dropped into the heart you're just like you're feeling joy you're you're feeling peaceful yeah. just anytime you do anything that lights you up in that way that's why we were saying singing i, I love singing mm -hmm. and dancing and walking nature. in nature and things like that yes being outside sunshine helps a lot feeling the sun on my on your on your face i think really helps bring that join us out i love that and it's just as simple as that just going outside yeah. Mm -hmm. And just closing your eyes and feeling the wind on your face yeah. and feeling the warmth of the sun and mm -hmm. do that with intention. You'll yes. And I feel like it's very much a physical feeling too. Like I've, cause there are times when I do pray and meditate and I don't feel anything mm -hmm. and I'm like, I don't feel like I'm connecting. Like, what is it going to take for me to feel everything in my center? But it feel like, I feel like when I'm fully connected, it was when there's like an actual like pull, like a magnetic pull to, mm -hmm. to just being something. Yeah. But that's truly what makes me feel centered is when I feel it physically and emotionally. And if I don't feel it physically, it's fine. I'll try again. It's no big deal. <laughs> exactly. I think that you shared so many beautiful pieces of advice. I love all the things that you do to practice self-love. I would love for you to tell people how they can connect with you and, and if there's any last words that you would like to share with them before we wrap up this, this beautiful episode, you are officially a part of the sacral circle sisterhood Yay. slash brotherhood. <laughs> how exciting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you can find me at my website at your sassy chef.com. I am also on Instagram at you are sassy chef, facebook.com slash your dash sassy dash dash chef. And those are my three main platforms. So if you need me, you can find me there. Um, you know, it's so funny because lately a lot of the stuff that I share on on my platforms and social media is strictly food. And I feel like I've gotten to a point where I would like to connect with people more on an emotional level. However, I am kind of scared, you know, like I was like, how do I, how do I take that next step into just into showing that I would love to share more with you aside from my recipes. <laughs> Because yeah. I think in my recipes and my healthy recipes, there's that comfort zone, you know, like I, I, it's easy for me to just post a recipe, like a blog recipe, but to actually talk about things that truly matter, like what we discussed this past 45 minutes, like I would really love to connect with people on that level. I'm just like, I'm not sure how, so I'm thinking maybe this might be the start of something, something new. Who knows? Absolutely. I yeah. You're in the process of of branching out and evolving, not only as a human being, but as you evolve your, what you do, you know, the work that you bring to the world will also start to shift. And I think it's brilliant to start adding the emotional mental stuff to some of the videos that you do or to the blogs or tying foods to, to sensations and feelings. And who knows, maybe it's even something as simple as, oh, the other day when I was making this, it brought up this memory of mine from blah, blah, blah. And so as you're telling a story, you're also delivering words of wisdom and empowering yeah. healing advice, you know, mm -hmm. just like the show. This so easy. You made it sound so simple. <laughs> sometimes it's just something, right? Sometimes it's, it's something really simple, but it's, we don't see it. And then it just starts to come into focus or we'll have a conversation with a person and they'll say something. You're like, oh yeah. Yeah. So, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to help yeah. each other and mm -hmm. to share our stories. And I honor you greatly for doing that work because I know it isn't easy. And I love mm -hmm. your transparency 
we need more authenticity in this world. That's what people are really craving. And you can't have that without vulnerability and humility. And you express mm -hmm. that so beautifully today. So thank you again mm -hmm. for blessing us with your time. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for having me. This was beautiful. And thank you to our beautiful listeners for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the Sacred Stories podcast on iTunes, where you'll find other impactful, inspiring shows. Connect with me via social media. Just search at The Sacral Circle. Your shares, likes, and follows are greatly appreciated because they help spread the love. As we say goodbye, always remember to know your worth and continue to love and value yourself wholeheartedly. Peace be in you.